Last year, I picked up a hobby for designing a single board computer based around the Zilog Z80 called the Tomato. I finished version 1 earlier this year, and it was everything that I wanted it to be when I set out. A simple system with RAM, ROM, and basic I.O. It was essentially a toy computer that you could plug in and run basic on. I was happy with the design, but it lacked a few things which led me to draw up designs for a new and improved version. I started by making a list of things that Tomato couldn't do that I knew I could implement. The Tomato has no memory to store files or programs on. Programs can be sent over serial, but it needs to be reloaded on every reboot. The only way to interact with the board is by plugging it into another PC. Software that emulates a serial terminal is essentially required. 32 kilobytes of RAM is nice, but you can't run most existing Z80 software with only that. And finally, I took a course at school where we picked apart a version of Unix, and one of the key features we focused on was context switching, and how a periodic hardware interrupt can allow for multitasking on a single CPU. There is no way to generate a regular interrupt on the tomato. My goal this time around would be to rectify these issues, while still retaining as much of the original functionality of Tomato version 1 as possible. When the Z80 was released, there were a bunch of extra peripheral chips that came out alongside it, like a serial I.O., GPIO interface, and a timer chip. These are all features you might find in a modern-day microcontroller. The parallel I.O. controller gives you two extra 8-bit I.O. lines that can be used to control other devices not on the main data bus. The counter timer chip gives you four interrupt-driven counters that can be used to periodically perform functions. Unfortunately, due to the way that these chips share the interrupt line, and because I didn't want to add any extra glue logic, the UART interrupt which was present on version 1 was removed. There is a friendly debate about using microcontrollers in projects like these, because they can break from the spirit of retro computing by mixing old and new tech. While I appreciate these sentiments about authenticity, microcontrollers are cheap, and they can be programmed to do lots of things that would require a lot of extra hardware. One feature I wanted to include was VGA output. VGA is surprisingly easy to implement in software, given a fast enough chip and a few I.O. lines. I started by looking at the AT Mega series, which I used in my EEPROM programmer. AT Megas have plenty of I.O., but I fear their relatively low maximum clock speed would have been a bottleneck. There is another microcontroller, one that has 32 GPIO pins, VGA hardware built in, and has 8 cores that can run processes in parallel. It's called the Parallax Propeller, and it costs only $8. I went with the propeller because, while one core handles video output, others can be used to control other I.O. devices that would be difficult to handle on the Z80, like an SD card or a PS2 keyboard. With one chip, three key items were checked off the wishlist. Using the propeller introduces a new set of challenges. It runs at 3.3 volts, not 5 like the rest of the chips on the board, and that means extra power regulation would be needed to keep the signals separate. Next is the question of how does the Z80 even talk to it? I was hesitant to put it on the data bus like the other I.O. devices because it runs with its own separate clock that would be out of phase with the rest of the board. The PIO has a bidirectional mode where two devices use its control lines for a handshake. This way data could be sent to and from the propeller asynchronously, with an interrupt alerting the CPU when a request was finished. The Z80 has an address space of up to 64 kilobytes, and the EEPROM chip I wanted to use is 32 kilobytes. So the next challenge was how to bank the ROM so you can use all 64 as RAM. Each memory chip has an enable line that when inactive sets all I.O. pins to be high impedance, which is how all the chips can operate on the same bus, so long as only one is active at the same time. Using a programmable output pin on the serial or PIO chips can switch the ROM on and off at will. After assembling version 2, it booted into the memory monitor on the first try, effectively proving that it could do anything the version 1 could. The next step was to test the new CTC and PIO chips by writing tests to make sure that they were working. Long story short, they weren't, but it was nothing that a resistor and a bodge wire couldn't fix. So where is the project now? Well, I have a library of tests that I can use to confirm that each new piece of hardware works. Next step is programming the propeller, which will be a new video on its own, and a port of CPM. The fact that everything is operating on a hardware level with only a couple of minor tweaks is a big relief. More peripherals means more opportunities to implement ideas that wouldn't have been possible on the original board, and I haven't even begun to push the limits of what can be done with this design.
If you want the schematics or the code I used in this video, all the resources for this project are available on GitHub. I usually add new code or documentation once or twice a week if you want to follow me.